thank you for um, your uh, splendid contributions and, and your active participation in what, what uh, has for myself at least been a wonderful uh, uh, conference and, and also worth all, all, all the work that goes into that kind of thing. Um, in this uh, closing uh, session, which I hope to be as informal as possible, uh, there will be uh, some reminiscences. Um, we have here a, a very special situation and one that we must admit is not likely to occur again because we have here a number of people who have worked uh, with Pryor, uh, known Pryor, and in Martin Pryor's case one should perhaps rather say live with Pryor, uh, but, we, but, but, but we do have this chance also to get some uh, glimpses uh, of, of prior, be they with an emphasis on the personal or the scientific. And uh, Kit Fine, Hans Kamp, Max Creswell and Martin Pryor have all volunteered to give just uh, a few minutes of personal uh, impressions of this kind. So when I'm, when I'm done, uh, 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 that will be the next uh, step of the, the closing uh, uh, session. And I won't take up too much of your time, but there are some general remarks I would like to, 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 to make. Um, and first of all, I'd like, uh, I'd like to, 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 to quote Pryor um, in uh, some free thinking on, on time that was uh, published first in, in, um, in uh, Logic and Reality in 1996. So that was one of the things that we dug out of the, the or rather, sorry, in this case, Peter Ostrom dug out of the archive. Well, here's what Pryor says. <clears throat> he says, so far then, as I have anything that you could call a philosophical creed, its first article is this. I believe in the reality of the distinction between past, present and future. I believe that what we see as a progress of events is a progress of events, a coming to pass of one thing after another, and not just a timeless tapestry with everything stuck there for good and all. Now, I'm sure nobody here will be surprised by the views expressed uh, here, but what I want to focus on quite briefly is not so much the well-known uh, position on, on, on the reality of the tenses and so on, but rather the intro where he says so far then as I have anything that you could call a philosophical uh, creed. Because <clears throat> it is uh, characteristic, I think, uh, of Pryor's work that it is not a general uh, philosophical system. I mean, it's, uh, Pryor is not a Heidegger and he's not a, a Wittgenstein in the sense of laying out an overweening philosophical uh, system. Uh, that does not mean that there are not red threads uh, in, in uh, Pryor's work. And indeed, I do believe that this conference and your contributions have very much been about uh, these red uh, threads. Uh, the fact that I also uh, mentioned uh, in the welcome, uh, in my short welcome talk, that the interest in Pryor has in general been growing, but it has also increasingly been acknowledged that it was not just tense logic, although that was his single most important contribution, but also his works in ethics, on propositions, on metaphysics, in hybrid logic, in theology, even bordering on, uh, on linguistics, uh, that this whole fabric is worth studying and that there are red threads uh, running uh, through these, these various subjects and crisscrossing uh, the whole work. Um, and one uh, uh, may, may, may add, if one w wishes to, to, to say a little bit about uh, Pryor's uh, importance, that uh, I, I would like to, to quote what, what, what Max, sent, uh, Max said uh, in his uh, talk that uh, in some ways the, the, the importance of a philosopher shows in that he, he, his work transcends itself as it were. I mentioned to you at the beginning that 
it just so happens uh, by coincidence that, that uh, briefly before this conference I was at another very different conference, uh, the Microsoft Research Summit uh, conference uh, in, in Seattle, but I, 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 I can't help noting uh, the, 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 the fun or, or the point uh, that in, in, in Seattle, in this very different setting, the keynote keynote was actually about the temporal logic of actions that obviously owes so much to prior. And then here, a fortnight after, here, here I am with you, uh, also uh, uh, discussing uh, prior. And that also um, maybe is a good example of uh, his work, or a kind of work, transcending itself and finding new venues into uh, um, other areas where you might not have expected it. Um, so I think... Um, there is a case both for doing what we have been doing, namely studying the subjects that were dear to Pryor and trying to bring them further. And this would probably have pleased Pryor more than the study of his uh, work uh, as such, but I think that there is a deserved case also for devoting study to the overall work of Pryor uh, as such. Um, and that, of course, is uh, the Nachlass uh, work is also a, a, a contribution uh, in that uh, direction, although it should not be forgotten, and that might also be a way of tempting you a little more into the Nachlass uh, work, that uh, you can actually uh, build uh, uh, fine publications on, on doing these uh, uh, studies and doing the, 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 the transcriptions. Uh, Synthes, for instance, has been very willing and in fact has declared its uh, willingness to accept only high quality papers, of course, uh, but, but papers of that kind. Um, apart from that, with the Nachlass, uh, we do have a, a, a peer review uh, process uh, where the transcriptions are checked and uh, annotations are uh, uh, peer reviewed and uh, discussed before the um, final uh, publication. We're going to acquire an ISSN uh, uh, number and in fact we sort of have in mind to, to make it into a quasi uh, uh, journal. So uh, uh, your efforts will also count as uh, publications. So uh, with this uh, little advertisement uh, spot, I would now like to ask Kit to come and uh, give some of your reminiscences. So when Tony Kenny was talking, uh, it was evident that uh, he felt that his relationship with Prior was very special, and very special both at the intellectual and the personal level. And I couldn't help feeling that well, my relationship was with Prab was also very special and exactly the same way, both at the personal and intellectual level. And actually, in many, de many of the same, very same details, like going on the canal trip and so on and so forth. <coughs> this actually left me with two feelings. Uh, one is, well, damn it, I thought I was the special one. <laughs> <laughs> but then, Tony Kenny was special too, and no doubt not just Tony Kenny, but countless others. So, but also there was a feeling, this is amazing that this man could have had such a special relationship with so many people, that made himself so significant in their eyes. And I just thought that it was just truly wonderful to, um, to learn from other people that they had had that very same feeling of, of being special. So let me just say a few words, and uh, I, I don't want to go on, uh, on about this. Um, I was uh, undergraduate in my second year uh, when Tony Kenny uh, helped bring uh, Prior to Balliol. And uh, I didn't know I gave Tony Kenny such a hard time, but anyway, I was shuffled off to, uh, to, 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 to Arthur Pryor. And uh, we didn't have orthodox uh, tutorials. It wasn't as if uh, you know, we went through some set material or anything like that. Uh, he just talked to me about what he was, was thinking about. So this was just quite wonderful from the, from the very start. And um, he really helped advance my career in, in many different ways. Um, 
One I remember very well. Uh, in uh, Oxford, we had to do what are called collections. Uh, so your, 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 your degree depends upon the final exam, but you do these sort of preparatory exams. Uh, I always try to avoid them. Um, but anyway, I did do a collection and one, uh, on a, on a, and one of the papers was on epistemology. Um, and uh, I think some question like, can you know if, it, if, it, if there's a possibility of the, if you, uh, of the thing being otherwise or something like that? I can't remember what the question was. But it involved, I know it involved um, the concept of knowledge and the concept of uh, possibility. So I did a little logic there. I presume how these operators might interact and so on and so forth. And um, Martin Hollis, uh, who was a lecturer here, I think, at the time, gave me a very low grade for this answer because he, he obviously thought this was not, a, not epistemology. And for some reason, the paper went to Arthur, and Arthur was of the opinion that they should get a high grade. And I ended up getting, getting a high grade. So. Uh, so that was one of the very first things he did to forward my career. I mean, it would have been, would have been real ignominy for me to have done badly in this paper. Um, uh, and then he, um, uh, after I, when I got my degree, I went to a job at the uh, University of Warwick, and I'm sure it was uh, as a result of his letter that I, that I got the job. But I did, um, while I was at Warwick, um, I, I did keep up my contact uh, with the priors. And uh, they, they invited me to uh, a, a canal trip. And in fact, uh, they invited me and uh, Bill Newton-Smith, who's a former fellow uh, of the college and who, worked, who did work on time. And this is a very memorable trip. <coughs> I mean, partly because I spent a lot of time discussing questions with, with Arthur uh, while managing the locks. Um, but also, I remember that a friend of mine had um, somehow discovered a warehouse where they were selling um, ladies' fur coats on the cheap. And I, I thought it might be a bit cold on, uh, on the boat. So um, I think both Bill Newton-Smith and I bought, or somehow acquired, two of these fur ladies' fur coats, very, very heavy. And so we arrived wearing these fur coats. Um, much to the astonishment, but not disapproval of, of, the, of the priors. Um, during the trip, Mary did all the cooking, and I was very fond of Mary's cooking, and she had actually made a, a mousse. And um, I don't know if it was her or someone else, but it dropped on the floor, and all the glass shards scattered everywhere. So Mary said, I don't think we should eat this. And I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's no way I'm not going to eat this mousse. But she said, no, no, you really, I said, no, no, I said, I'll, I, it's, so I insisted. So I tried to, I thought, well, look, the shards aren't going to get into the very middle of the mousse. So I scooped out the middle of the mousse and ate it. And so there were three or four hours when people were sort of waiting for me to die. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad to say that I can live to, to tell the tale. Um, the other experience uh, I had, which was actually somewhat akin to the experience Tony had is that, I mean, this is, again is, is a tribute to the extraordinary generosity of both of Mary and Arthur. Um, Tony was going through a religious crisis and, and stayed with the priors uh, during part of that uh, time. Uh, I was going through a marital crisis at the time. This was after Arthur had died. And so, so Mary said, well, you know, I, I think a marital crisis is just as bad and perhaps in some ways it's the very same thing as a, a religious crisis. But anyway, uh, whether she thought that was, was equally deserving or not, she did uh, say, look, why don't you uh, come and stay, uh, stay with me, which, which I did. And this is something I very much appreciated. And the priors really showed us extraordinary kindness when we had a, this is my, with my first wife, when we had a first child. They um, gave, us, gave us various things. We you know, weren't, weren't very well off. Um, and I remember when Arthur was first diagnosed with a heart condition, he had to slim down. And he actually did an extraordinarily good job. But that meant that um, he had to discard many of his clothes because they were just too big for him. Well, Arthur was not of great stature. Uh, not all of the clothes, I mean, if I wore his discarded pants, they would probably come up to there or somewhere. But he did have this lovely velvet coat, which was too big for him. 
And uh, this, was, this was a possession of his that, that I could wear, and, and which I did, did, did treasure. Uh, unfortunately, I still don't have it with me. I wish I, wish I could have worn it to this, <laughs> to this occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have got nothing like this to offer. Um, and a couple of <coughs> personal remember, memories I already mentioned earlier today. Let me very briefly remember or repeat them. Uh, so um, after this first time when Arthur Pry and I met when he was visiting professor at UCLA and I was a beginning graduate student. Um, he then, uh, after he left and I stayed at UCLA, but I always came back to Europe during the summer, he invited me over to Oxford a number of times, I think I already said. It was on the first of those visits that he introduced me to Kit, who was sitting in a little office Actually, very close to this side, Kit would be able to describe it more. It's something called Hollywell. It's actually not very close to here, but it's very close to where we all were staying in, 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 in the Jowett building. Uh, it was called Hollywell Mayor? Manor. Manor, Manor, Manor. Anyway, so, um, and the last of these occasions, I think I already also said this. Um, I actually, or he and I, traveled from Oxford, where I had come to see him, together to this conference in Oberwolf Wolfhart, his first conference on what was called the study of time, or just time, which the picture was shown earlier. Uh, and uh, he was already quite sick at that point. I still remember very vividly that Mary told me and <coughs> made me promise solemnly that I would always carry his suitcase and take no, no for an answer and insist. And, uh, in the, I mean, yes, she said it in his presence, so in the end he realized that he would put me on the spot if he wouldn't let me do that. So I, I was allowed to carry his suitcase. And it was clear that he was not well. But uh, so as I, I think I already said this morning, uh, from this conference, which lasted for about a week, he went on to Norway, and that's where he then died. And uh, I heard this only about well, two or three weeks after it happened. And in spite of the fact that I knew he was sick, it was still well, the shock that it could not but have been. And um, so one of the things that have stayed with me, and I was reminded of that uh, today and yesterday when Per and Peter were saying they were looking for tapes of his voice. And it made me think back of his voice. And it's interesting that although there's a lot that I don't remember, the voice actually comes back to me quite vividly. And it conveys this sense, and I'm here repeating what other people have already said, this extraordinary mixture of warmth, a sense of fun, and absolutely no nonsense. Um, and, and so that's, in fact, the picture that I, I, I carry with me of him as a person. There is one thing, although this is actually not perhaps quite the right occasion for it, but I want to bring up, because it is, in a way, a unique opportunity because of the people who are here. And that has to do with, with something that has been mentioned a number of times and, and discussed at some length in, 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 in papers, um, in particular the one by uh, uh, Jorgensen and Blackbird, <coughs> um, about the, the, the origin of this, this stuff about now. So, it was like this, that in, it was a, Montague had a seminar on pragmatics in the fall of 67. And it was in the course of that seminar, it was actually a rather productive seminar. Among other things, it was the first time that David Lewis presented his theory of counterfactuals. And Howard Sobel uh, presented something similar. Um, and 
something that was really quite well known at that point among all the people involved was that there was pragmatics, at least in the sense that you had these indexical words like I and you and now and here, and uh, any kind of reasonable formal semantics for natural language would have to account for the way in which they contribute to the meaning of what you say via the irrelevant uh, components of the utterance context. And it was, I can't remember exactly for what reason it was, after one of these seminars, uh, a number of us were going out to dinner and Monty and I were sitting in the back of the, may have been on the way back from the dinner, or I can't remember. In any case, I sort of very timidly suggested to Montague, well, I, yeah, couldn't we actually treat now as a tense operator like P and F? And his reaction was rather brusque and said, oh, why would you want to do that? I mean, it's very straight. I mean, this is an indexical, and we know how to do that. It's an individual constant, period. Now, of course, an individual concept for times is actually something that didn't really fit very well with the sort of priori picture of tense logic. And uh, I shut up. <laughs> and then I uh, sort of went home and I thought about it again. And I thought, well, it's, it's these two indices, I can just keep track of the utterance time somehow in the recursive definition of truth, and all would fall out. And I still, I was, I was really excited. And uh, I even rang. Want to do up, although it was going quite late, uh, and uh, so rather and explained it to him, and then he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, now I see the point. It's very supportive." And then I presented this uh, stuff in the seminar at one point, and uh, the, the the early uh, little write-up on this that 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 prior refers to in his uh, newspaper now actually was right up for that, that event. Now the reason why I mention this is that whatever little hullabaloo is involved in double indexing, it really is necessary only if you treat now as a sentential operator, as a tense operator. When you treat it as an individual constant, in the way that Montague did at the time, and other people, like you had an indexical constant for I, an indexical constant for you, an indexical constant for me. None of that is necessary. You just have to have an architecture where the context can do some of the referential tasks that have to be performed in order to get the truth conditions out of what's being said. And if you for those who know this stuff, I mean, this, this Kaplanian conception, three-level conception of meaning with extension, intention, and character, that actually, if you look at the details, is very much based in, 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 in what he says about I and you. I mean, I and you. I mean, these are constants that get their reference from the context, and then you plug that in in order to compute the... Um, well, both the intent, but in particular the intention of the utterance of which these words are part. And, and one way of doing, uh, of, of, of one way of applying that is to actually do the same thing for now. And then that, that really makes double indexing as such really superfluous. So um, whether you want to treat now as a sentence operator is another matter. And I think. We've moved very much away from it in my own work on tense and aspect. That's all disappeared, and, and now it actually introduces a discourse reference for a time like, like, like many other elements in the sentence do. So there may be arguments against doing that, but they are arguments and more generally against treating tenses in the way that tense logic, logic suggests. But if for some reason or other you want to uh, treat. Now, as a sentence operator, it's only then when this necess necessity arises, at least with tense logic, all sorts of other applications of double indexing now. But of course, it all has to do with how the indexes, the two or the more indexes you have, interact with each other, and now uh, is a special 
way in which the interaction takes place, as uh, the various references to it in this conference have shown again. Uh, so uh, the, the, the point of, of bringing this up is that, uh, especially in the, in the Blackburn Jorgensen paper, it was pointed out that Pryor actually saw that you could do the same thing by having a nominal n, uh, which isn't exactly as having, uh, the same thing as having an individual or constant. But it sort of goes back in that direction. So the hybrid logic of which treating n as a nominal is a part has a position, if you think of it in the terms I was trying to refer to, somehow in between the sort of pure tense logic on the one hand, where you don't have nominals, but only general propositions, and uh, the kind of treatment of tensed language where you actually have variables and constant referring in a standard way in which variables and constant do that two times. That's all I have to say. Thank you. The little few stories I've got are already, I think, on record in the interview that I did. But I do have to say one or two of them. But one thing I will add, um, Kit mentioned what happened when he had a tutorial with Arthur. I know I used to see him once a fortnight in Manchester, and I would go with a list of problems that I had in the thesis that I was writing. I don't believe he ever once answered any of my questions, but he would be intrigued with something I'd said and go on and tell me all about what was going on there and, and whether, I, whether I assimilated it or not, I don't know, but certainly that was... That, that playfulness was part of it. And the story that I do remember was that when in August of 1961 I arrived in Manchester at the uh, serious age of 21, um, the first thing that Arthur said to me, he said, Mr. Cresswell, isn't it a pity that God doesn't exist? Now, whether how this related to the crises of faith that we've been hearing about at this conference, I don't know. I think he was clearly baiting me. I was a little bit naive at that point. He probably knew it. And um, uh, I don't remember what he went on to say, why he, he began to think, th think that that was important. But that was certainly the idea of teasing you, the idea of, of playing with you. I do remember the other story that, I, that some of you have heard was that we had at Manchester, there was an MA student, I think it was from Iraq, it was from a, a Middle Eastern country, and Arthur said to him, and what is your Muslim name? And the guy looked and he said, well, I, he wasn't actually a believer. And Arthur had to try to explain how we talked about Christian names and surnames. And so obviously if you came from Iraq, you would have a Muslim name and surname. And then this, 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 this poor student really didn't know where he was. There was part of the playfulness was that you didn't always quite know where you, where you were with him. And, and, uh, and that is certainly something I remember. Yes, I remember the kindness. I, I know at one point I, uh, <clears throat> I, I had a car I, and uh, I, I was going away for a while and they allowed me to use their, their garage and their house at Manchester. But also I remember the day of my oral exam for the PhD and the two examiners were Arthur and uh, uh, C.A. Meredith and Arthur had some money to, um, uh, some entertainment money. And so it was a very sunny day and he knew I had a car. And so I drove Meredith Pryor, Mary Pryor, the four of us drove to see churches. We, we had lunch at some place in Cheshire and they wanted to go to churches. I, in fact, I took a photograph of, of, of Meredith lying on a, lying on a gravestone. It was the only one time I met Meredith briefly, and of course the circumstances being a PhD examination, especially since they wanted a certain amount of rewriting. Uh, so it was a, a somewhat tense day, and I perhaps didn't relax during this, but that, that, was, that, was, that was how they, uh, that was the informality, that after, after the examination we all went off for lunch and then we went driving around looking at churches in, in, in Cheshire. There's not much more really that I want to 
I, I want to add, I, I think I can say that the prior that, that Kit and, and, and Hans have described is the one I knew, and um, I think that we are all grateful for that, and we all feel uh, grateful for the support and for the encouragement and everything that he did for us. Well, I, um, I was wondering what on earth I should say, having spoken uh, last night, um, and so I got out my thing to make notes, and I found in the end that I had uh, quite a few, and I'm afraid I've got the problem of cutting down, possibly. Um, one thing which struck me when uh, 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 the three people before me uh, were speaking was, um, when I was a student, how many of my professors and lecturers had I ever met their children and family, possibly their wives? Uh, and I, I couldn't uh, think of any, but um, I certainly um, remember Max and I remember Kit and I uh, met um, uh, I met Hans. Uh, he, he, of course, uh, 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 knew Arthur from uh, Los Angeles, UCLA. Um, and uh, so uh, I was very conscious of the sort of um, Social, uh, social ambience that uh, Arthur and Mary uh, created. Uh, I, and certainly I remember a lot of uh, names, uh, although a lot of them, are, well, Jonathan Bennett, you will, uh, I think uh, everybody knows. Um, and uh, of course, along with uh, Kit, there were colleagues of his, I think there was an Andrew Saint or somebody like that. Um, and uh, somehow we were, I was aware of... Uh, do you remember Manny? Do you remember Manny? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes. Uh, do you, have you any contact with him? No, we, uh, in fact, I talked to Mary, but he just disappeared from the face of the earth. Right. Um, and this gentleman, uh, Arthur, asked what his uh, Muslim name was. Um, I think he was known by his colleagues as, if it's the person I'm thinking of, as, uh, as Jim. Uh, uh, Najim Bizergen? Was that? Sounds vaguely right. I mean, he was certainly there in 1961 when I arrived. Right, I think I remember him. And when I arrived and started um, my uh, econo economics and econometrics course in 63, um, he was a fellow student, and we were once or twice in the same. Uh, Student Society, I think the Movement for Colonial Freedom, as it was then, I think it's changed its name. Um, but I, um, I I thought I would uh, make, uh, go to another couple of headings. Um, of course, I remember very well uh, coming over to uh, Oxford in 1956, uh, which was very strange because we started in January and finished in uh, uh, December which of course straddled two uh, uh, academic years and was quite peculiar. But nevertheless, I remember just the same thing, various people coming around, um, not only Karu Meredith, but his uh, son, I think. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I certainly remember visiting the Austins and, uh, and I certainly remember the people we called the Geechcombs. Um, <laughs> and, uh, oh, I remember uh, we went to uh, Whipsnade Zoo once with one or uh, two of uh, Geech's children, I think. Um, I, I, I think I remember quite a few of those. Um, and I think, um, even though I wasn't aware that he was making sort of um, landmarks in the development of um, contact between logicians, I was aware of uh, I was aware of all these people. And I, uh, not least when we went to Finland in um, 1962, um, and uh, there was this. Uh, it was a very mild, self-effacing uh, 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 person who once came out for a meal with us. Uh, and I was told, oh, this is Richard. And um, I, nobody could forget uh, Saul, Saul Kripke. Um, 
And um, many years later, when I started linguistics, um, they were talking vaguely about uh, they were talking vaguely about uh, Richard Montagu, and I thought, oh yes, yes, I knew uh, I met Richard uh, all those years ago, and I had no idea that he was uh, such an important person, um, and. Uh, Oh, there was a, a, a very strange incident which um, straddled um, both 56 and 62. Uh, we went to Dublin and, of course, uh, Wokashevich had passed away by then, but we went to visit um, Madame Wokashevich and uh, I don't know what her state of mind was, but uh, there were so many wicked people among the uh, f uh, philosophical world. And I think one of the um, villains of the piece was this uh, gentleman uh, called Tarski. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, this sort of monstrous person called Tarski. And uh, when, I, uh, when there was some kind of reception for the, uh, 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 for the people at the uh, conference in Helsinki, um, there was this elderly, small, mild-looking person um, uh, sitting in the corner, uh, not really talking to anybody at, at that particular moment. And uh, either Arthur or Mary said, that's Tarski. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think um, that really brings me on to uh, one thing which really made uh, a very strong uh, impression on me. Um, Right from the outset, um, all these uh, all these Polish names, um, well, Lukasiewicz, Lukasiewicz, or whatever it was pronounced. Um, I think um, Bochensky, uh, Kotarbinski, Bednarowski, um, and if you want to know what um, contacts Arthur had with Polish magicians. Uh, all you have to do is say the name to me and I'll try uh, and it will either ring a bell or it won't. <laughs> um, but I discovered my uh, interest in languages when I was about 10 and I, um, I think I, I, I got some teach yourself books out. Um, I'm afraid that I had a golden rule. I freaked out if they had a different alphabet. I wasn't interested in alphabets, I was interested in languages. Uh, so Arabic didn't really count. Russian sort of counted, uh, Greek count, sort of counted. Um, but um, when I came over to uh, Oxford, uh, I went to Blackwell's. There wasn't really any shop like Blackwell's in Christchurch. And um, to the bafflement of uh, the uh, shopkeeper, I was 11 at the time, I got Tesla's, J. Tesla's um, Polish grammar. And, uh, uh, anyway, I, um, I, 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 I taught myself a little bit of um, Polish, it, uh, and it uh, was a little bit like Russian. Uh, I learnt Russian for six months in New Zealand when we went back, um, and then I went on to an exchange in 1984 in Poland, and uh, all the Polish came back. So um, uh, uh, that is one of the things probably which um, uh, most strongly uh, is a recollection is in fact the uh, contacts uh, with the Polish people and uh, having a reason to uh, learn a bit, uh, as well as a girlfriend uh, for some time over there. Um, learning uh, quite a bit of the Polish language. And um, I think I'll just say one final thing. Um, uh, people got in contact with uh, Mary from Denmark and I vaguely heard about these people from about uh, 1995, on, six onwards. Um, and then uh, uh, I met them finally in 98 and um, was vaguely talking about tense logic. Yes, he did tense logic. Um, then I heard a strange remark which nobody had ever suggested to me that he was the father of tense logic, was he? Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, 
So it's strange how one has these personal memories, but on the other hand, one somehow doesn't always link in with the critical uh, um, academic and intellectual facts, but nevertheless a lot uh, impresses themselves. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for...